Welcome back to episode 24 of uh, the Smoking Snake Podcast. Of course, I am your host, Peter, joined as always by the other co-host, Enric. Enric, how are you doing tonight? I'm pretty good. Uh, very happy to be here. It's a Wednesday night and having a chance to talk, to talk about Botafogo with our uh, other host in this podcast today. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got uh, a special guest today. Uh, our guest today... Uh, is a creator on YouTube uh, where he talks about much more than just football and, and Botafogo, but uh, we're interested in his, uh, his expertise in um, Botafogo. Uh, so thanks for joining us. Uh, Pete from Glorious Botafogo. How are you, Pete? Thanks, uh, man. I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks for, um, thanks for the invite. Um, I appreciate it being here. And, and when we talk about Botafogo and Santos, it's such a historic partnership um, in football, you know, especially Brazilian football. And to think that the two clubs are responsible for the dynasty that Brazil has in world football is uh, it's crazy. So when it comes to Botafogo and Santos, uh, and I've always said to friends, like, if I wasn't Botafogo, I'd be Santos. So for sure. Awesome. That, that's, that's great to hear. And yeah, I mean, right off the bat, I mean, uh two incredibly prestigious clubs um that that yeah carried carried that brazilian side those brazilian sides throughout the 60s 70s 80s um so before we get uh too far into into Botafogo um just curious how did you um start your interest in football specifically um and uh how did you have your interest you know how did you find your interest in Botafogo man um my dad was a pro player in Brazil. Uh, he never saw like extremely high levels of, of competition, but he did play against Zico uh, wow. a couple of times. Um, nutmegged him once. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then from that moment on, my dad got signed into our arch nemesis Flamengo. So my dad had to, to play for those rats for uh, a season. But... Uh, yeah, so it's just always been in the family's kind of in the blood, you know. Um, ever since I could walk, I was kicking a soccer ball. Ever since I could uh, run, I was running with the ball, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm not saying I was ever great, but <laughs> I was I was good enough to play. Uh, and then Botafogo is always the same thing. It's just ever since I've known myself as a person of Botafogo has always been a a connection you know my dad is a Botafogo supporter um my mom's actually a Vasco supporter which is another the Rio team um but I have uncles that are Botafogo supporters so it's kind of scattered throughout the Rio teams my uh, my uh household both my dad's and my mom's side of the family but you know it's kind of like what we say say about the Fogo you're you're chosen you don't choose to be about the Fogo about the Fogo chooses you and here we are nice okay and so what inspired you to uh, to create those, um, both the Twitter account and, of course, now the YouTube account? Well, <laughs> I love how chaotic Twitter is. So <laughs> I feel at home in chaos. So it just, I felt right at home. I've had my other account for a long time. Um, not the Botafogo one, but the other one. My media stuff, entertainment account. And... Once I saw that Botafogo was being purchased by an American, John Texter, I, I saw that as the perfect opportunity to, you know, combine two things that I love, which is one living in America and two Botafogo and, and put them into one thing. And it worked out. Nice. So obviously Botafogo, like we mentioned, an extremely important club in Brazil um, the last decade or so has seen them kind of uh, yo-yo up and down a bit, uh, one yep. could say. Um, you know, how has it been following them through this time period, specifically in this in their history? 
um, you know, bouncing between leagues. Has it been a bit harder even just keeping up with them uh, from the U.S.? So the first time we we bound, we got relegated was in the early 2000s. Um, and at that point, I was so mad that I just stopped following. I was so mad, right? Because I was like, we shouldn't be there. This is BS. But the focus should always be in this area. So every now and then I would watch a match, you know, because we, we got back up the following year. And then, you know, when I was watching the, the match, that was the, the deciding factor to see if we we're going to move up or not. And we won. I was like, yeah, you know, more than the obligation here to be the winner and go back. You know, I was never into the mindset like of the club ever being in Seti B again, which happened two more times due to poor administration problems and and debts that just kind of kept accumulating over the years and snowballing and snowballing until they got too big to deal with. And, and which is why the club got sold to John Texter. But, you know, following from the U.S. is was kind of hard in the beginning, you know. And then as um, Brazil started to catch up technology-wise, um, as far as, like, streaming services and stuff like that, it got a lot easier. But I would, I would always try to find a way. It was through a, a pirated link or somebody's phone on YouTube, somebody recording the screen on YouTube and, and showing that or through the radio because radio in brazil is huge by the way it's a huge medium of communication especially when it comes to uh, football so the all the matches are broadcast through radio so i would just go on the website of the of the channel and i would, would listen you know um so w whatever would work if the link wasn't working i'd go back to the radio if the if the the video was working again. I would pause the radio, go back to the screen and watch it. And then, you know, just bounce back and forth. Anything to, to be able to, to watch. And during those times, I was really just, it was an act of self-harm because Botafogo was <laughs> <laughs> horrible throughout some of those years. Yeah, that's funny how you say it, Lee. It's difficult to manage to find how to watch the games live. And just like any other team, Botafogo yeah. has had their ups and downs. And back in 2012, actually, they signed a footballing legend, previous Real Madrid, Milan, Inter player, who had just won Serie A the next uh, year prior to that, mm -hmm. Clarence Sedorf. And I wanted to ask you, how did the club and the fans react to his arrival, knowing that he was such a champion? Uh, uh, Sedorf was a huge signing and i think he would be a huge signing for just about any club in the world much less you know coming to brazil and playing um a couple of guys that were working at the botafogo uh, staff at the time they gave out an interview late last year or even perhaps earlier i don't remember it might have been last year where you know when the possibility came up you know they went to italy and they sat down with them and, and started negotiating and he was kind of all in because his wife uh, at the time was Brazilian. I think they're divorced now. Um, and I think she was a Botafogo supporter as well. So I think that might have helped. But, you know, he was very aware of the club and, and the history of the club. And uh, because it, I don't know if you guys know, but he's actually from South America. Uh, he's not actually from the Netherlands. He's just naturalized citizen of the Netherlands. He's from French Guyana, I think, something like that. Um, so he's South American, and I guess he wanted to come back to his home uh, home continent to, to play, and he chose Botafogo. And when he arrived, I don't know if you guys ever seen the video of supporters going to the airport, and they basically put the airport in lockdown. You know, <laughs> nobody could go anywhere. Sadorf came out, and he, was, he had the flag and the jersey, and everybody was singing and, and cheering and clapping. It was great, and he had a great run too for Botafogo. Man, he was one of his in the seasons where he scored most, one of the most goals in his career. I think it was playing for Botafogo, so it was great to see. Yeah, that was a little bit of my suspicion. Uh, I didn't do the research, but I was thinking maybe he is from Brazil, and I never knew about it. But there's other players, big players in Europe as well, who were born in South America, like Virgil Van. Like from Suriname, so right. that's great. It's crazy to think for that yeah. fact. There's there's a lot of people that a lot of talent that gets exported, and you don't even know sometimes because they get 
Now, like Tiago, for example, you know, from um, Liverpool and Bayern, he's, um, you know, Brazilian, but he's naturalized Spaniard because he was born there. And his brother's naturalized, his brother's still Brazilian. Or like the Giovanni brothers from Mexico, they're Brazilian, but they're naturalized. Um, the Dos Santos brothers, Giovanni Dos Santos. And, yep. Yeah, they're both from Brazil, too. I mean, their dad is, but, you know, there's a lot of those out there. That's more than true. And knowing how much you love the team and the club, what would you say uh, Botafogo compares? How do how do they compare and cope to state rivalry teams like Fluminense and Flamengo when it comes to tournaments that they play within the state? Uh, Flumi who? Fluminense. Oh, sorry. They're, they're, they're so small, <laughs> I forget about them all the time. Uh, um... <laughs> Fluminense, um, I got like no ill uh, feelings towards them. It just because they're they're kind of the joke of of the four, you know. We always joke around that they're the smallest team and that they're they're the virgin of, of the Americas because they've never won an, an international trophy and they've been relegated all the way down to the C division and. With some trickery and some money under the table, they were able to go from the third division back to the first without having to play the second. You know, all bribery and trickery and all that stuff that they do. So I, I kind of don't even see them as a, a rival, to be honest. Um, but they're a good team. You know, they're uh, uh, they're very decent these last couple of years. Uh, they have this forward that's probably one of the best of the country. Cano, he's an Argentinian forward. He's phenomenal. Um, they have a good coach. Um, their manager is, you know, right now they're he's being talked as perhaps taking the mantle for the national team and being a national team coach because he is great. He's he's an amazing tactician. You know, he's really good about doing that sort of stuff. Um, Vasco is a team that kind of like Botafogo has been up and down a lot uh, these last few years. Um, you know, uh, uh, comparing to the other 12, what we call in Brazil, the 12 big clubs, um, you know, Botafogo and Vasco as of late, they've been up and down more often than the other ones. You know, some of them will have a hiccup and then they're back right next year. But um, Vasco is a big question mark right now, man. Um, in, in the past, they were great rivals. You know, it's always been a, a, a very friendly match between Botafogo and Vasco. It's, there's no animosity like Botafogo and Flamengo, for example, where things get deadly. You know, people have died because of this rivalry. You know, Botafogo and Flamengo is it's a pretty big rivalry. But um, Vasco has always been like the of the three, the closest brother or the closest cousin, I guess you can say. Um, but right now they're a big question mark. They just played a, a friendly against uh, River Plate, and they lost three zero. Meanwhile, Botafogo played a friendly at the end of the season last year against Crystal Palace and tied. We're talking about a Premier League team versus another, you know, South American team at the end of the season versus at the beginning of the season. So a lot of that stuff um, is going to count in the long run. So Bos was a big question mark. And then Flamengo, those a holes, they, they, see, there's a lot of trickery with Flamengo too, man. More than Fluminense, Flamengo are known for being a dirty team throughout the years, having help from referees, having help from the own Brazilian federation, having help from uh, sponsors get making more money than the other teams just because. Like a lot of shady stuff. If things were a lot more fair from the nineties on, um, I don't think Flamengo would really be as big as they are today, uh, in terms of popular. I mean, during the eighties there's a big reason because of Zico, you know, phenomenal player. Uh, you know, they, they compare Zico's dribbling to like Messi dribbling, you know, not as complete as a player, but with the ball on his feet, he was just amazing. You know, so he just like Messi completely changed the landscape of Barcelona, Zico changed the landscape for Flamengo and became their biggest idol. So during that time, 
there was a lot of conversion to Flamengo fans as TV became more popular in Brazil from the 70s into the 80s. More people were able to watch matches and, and things of the nature. Um, so their fan base grew. And with more fans, their sponsors would give you more money because there's more eyes on the sponsorships and et cetera, blah, 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 shirt sales. So over the years, they were able to, to really build a, a good foundation to where they have incredible teams. I mean, I can, I can hate on the club all I want, but the players that are playing, you know, there's starting 11 and bench, 22 players. Any of those players can pick a team and can start. You know, I mean, that, that's how good their entire roster is. So no wonder they've them and Palmeiras have basically monopolized a lot of the, the titles over the last few years. You know, Libertadores titles and Brazilian Cup titles or Brazilian Serie A titles because they're good. So they're the hardest right now to compete against. And they are, they are our biggest rival. Um, so it's it's kind of sucks, but I think Botafogo's on the way up. And, and soon enough, I mean, we still beat them. Even even when there's this difference, they we still whoop their butt. So whatever. Yeah, I mean, like you said, Botafogo definitely on the way up. Um, just two years ago in the second division, uh, winning it in 2021. Uh, last yeah. year, straight up the table to, uh, you know, mid-table finish. Um, round of 16 in Copa del Brasil. Um, a lot of positives coming out of last season as well. You got to see Textor's financial mus muscle, um, yeah. you know, attracting um, stars maybe that are a little bit of questionable in Europe, um, like Luis Enrique from um, uh, uh, from Olympique de Marseille. I had the rises of Jafinho. Um so just curious, how do you how do you look back on on last season? Uh, a lot of good times. Uh, are you optimistic you can build on that, or do you think they're going to kind of have to stay in that mid table range um, before they take a, another step forward? I think I think Botafogo finishes top eight this year. Um, you know, the second leg of the Brazilian Championship is where we got the 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 reinforcements that really made a big impact and made a big difference. And on the second leg of the tournament, we were in fourth. So if we had that same team from the very beginning with the preseason and, you know, hopefully we're able to sign some more players in this first window, if not the second window. And I think we got a chance. Um, the Brazilian championship is very unforgiving. If you start bad, you better, you better pull something out of, you know, out of the hat because, it's going to be it's going to be tough for you to even try to do anything much less if you're losing and you're in relegation zone it's like sinking sand once you're in the relegation zone in brazil you're you're trying to survive but i think the fact that we never got down that that low on the table last year we were always mid table and then you know it wasn't until the very last fixture uh, if we had won, we would have made into the Libertadores. That's how close we were, you know. So we went from like eighth to eleventh, you know, because things are so close in Brazil. Like, uh, you know, from the second, if you win, if you have a good season like Palmeiras did, and you win, you know, five or six fixtures ahead, anywhere between second and like eleventh, anything can happen, you know. So it's because there's a lot of big teams in Brazil. But I was very, I was very happy that we were fighting for a Libertadores spot, uh, you know, in the in the last fixture of the of the tournament. Didn't happen. We lost. Um, but now we're gonna go into the um, uh, Sul Americano, which is like the Europa League, you know, of South America, which is fine because we. I mean, I would have much rather gone to the Libertadores. No, no doubt about that. More money, more eyes, more sponsors, whatever. But we have a chance uh, uh, at the Europa League. I think we have you know, the Brazilian Europa League, we have the real chance of being champions. And not only does that give you money, that puts you straight into the group stage of the Libertadores Cup for the following year. So that takes off the pressure of having to fight for that spot in the National League because it's very competitive there. You know, um, some of these other South American teams from, you know, Bolivia, Peru, or Chile... 
they're just not up to par because uh, the 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 difference is absurd in the quality of squads because sponsors are not looking at those leagues. Those leagues are barely scraping by to survive. You know, so when a Brazilian team plays those teams, they they you know they move on easily. So the Sul Americana tournament is kind of one of those where it it really won't be a competition until knockout stages, you know, and then and then it's game on because there's teams from Libertadores that got knocked off, you know, that are coming down and so on. And then it becomes a really interesting tournament. But I, I think that, the you know, top eight finish at the very worst, to be honest. Um, and I hope we can win at least uh, one title this year. That, that'd be nice. Yeah, 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 and 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 we're gonna get to you know the current state of Botafogo in 2023, and uh, you know more about that. I just want to leave 22 or 2022 season with one last question. Um, we started the podcast back in August, um, mm -hmm. and this was one of the first topics that uh, we talked about, and was a real head scratcher. Um, curious to know what you were thinking at the time. It did looks like it. I mean, it looked like it were, looked out. Uh, you guys brought in Chiquinho. Um, but Arison, uh, the striker, <laughs> was leading the team, uh, looked like a, a star, was was absolutely tearing it up, um, and was moved away from the team. It left Enric and I scratching our heads. Uh, what did you make of that move? Um, and obviously, it looks like no harm, no foul. But uh, in the moment, um, what, were, what were your thoughts on that move? Um, just like everyone else, I thought it was odd. Um, as to why, but then as it go along, and then you, I've learned to do a little bit of informative journalism because I got friends in the Botafogo media that kind of give me pointers here and there because I never really expected anything to happen with the page, but what well, it did, and then so I started doing a little bit of digging, and it kind of turns out that Edison just didn't fit Castro's play. He just didn't fit the way that Castro sees the number nine acting Castro's nine he likes them to to be both a target man and a false nine he's got to have that ability to to be a false nine as well and Edison just didn't you know because I don't know if you if you see a lot of goals from Edison he's just getting that ball and he's trampling through everybody and he's scoring right you bounce into him you bounce off like he's just a freak of nature he's strong and he's fast and he's got a lot of power but for the type of game that Luis Castro wants to to implement, um, I don't think Arison had any any room in it. He just doesn't fit the style of play. You know, he's great for teams that perhaps play with two strikers, you know, or or two wingers and a striker or all out attack. He's gonna be amazing in, in that kind of scenario. But Luis Castro likes the number nine to be mobile. You know, come out. You know give the assist too if you have to and Arison just didn't have that vision you know like on field vision to be able to also act as a playmaker and because Tiquinho is man he's just unbelievable he's so good you know uh it's crazy it's hard to believe I, I you know I used to play FIFA all the time um I, I I quit this year because I was gonna have a stroke playing that game but anyways <laughs> um but I would always see Chiquinho on FIFA, and I'm like, man, I wish he would come and play for Botafogo. Like, he's so good. Because, you know, playing FIFA, you start to notice other players and other teams, and you start looking at highlights because some of them make it to the team of the week, and you start to like some players, and then you start to follow the players. And Chiquinho was one of those, you know, um, from the Portuguese in Porto. Uh, uh, I like Porto in, in Portugal because that's my, my family's from around the area. Um and Tequino was a beast at Porto. So uh, I, I, it was stuff of dreams. I'm like, man, it's kind of like, <laughs> obviously not not in the scale of Clarence Sadorf, which I've never in a million years would have thought he would sign for Botafogo. But Tequino was like, okay, if he comes to Brazil, he's definitely going to go to like a Palmeiras or a Corinthians or a Flamengo because they have more money. But the game's changed. Yeah, it's, it's funny how you brought that up about FIFA because I've played the game too since 2018 and 
I stopped to this year. It's I just couldn't handle the pressure of continuing and losing and waiting for players to come in in order to win games and mm. stuff like that. So I remember my beef with FIFA is that there's no skill gap in that game. <laughs> Anybody can come in and just play, and as long as they're abusing the the mechanics, <laughs> they'll find a goal. Exactly. There's zero skill in that game. It's just spamming. Anyways, I'll be here all day talking about it. <laughs> 100%. And Chiquinho Suarez, again, is a player that I also remember. He was around 76 rated, non rear card. And, Something like that, and, yeah. Yeah. So he played for Porto, and I believe he was at Olympiacos too. If, am I right? Right, yeah. That's where he came from, Olympiacos, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, he's a great player, and he's he's done a really good job with Botafogo last season, uh, oh, winning yeah. 3-0 against Santos two games before the league was over. And then when they lost against Atletico Paranaense, as you mentioned, a great chance to qualifying for Libertadores, but they did not. So a question yeah. I would like to ask you is, uh, 2023 season has started, and Sunday they played the first game at home against Audax Angra in Campeonato Carioca, which mm -hmm. they lost. Mm -hmm. So what was your reaction from this match and your expectations for this, for this competition this year? Um that match in particular, uh, Botafogo went with the um, what's called the Botafogo B is a, like a, a, a new team that John Texer created that anybody that is in the roster to be in the A team that is not performing um, or maybe transitioning from like, a, you know, an injury or something like that. If they don't come back 100 percent and they have to, to to play some more, they go to the B team. Um, because the B team was supposed to play a Brazilian tournament of, you know, with other clubs that have that team as well, because not every club in, in Brazil have B teams, um, mainly the bigger ones do. Um, but then CBF um, killed that tournament. So now we have two teams, one that is clearly the A team that's going to play the, all the main competitions, and we have a B team that's probably good enough to play the second division and 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 do well. But you can't do that in Brazil. Just, you know, Barcelona and Real Madrid can do that in, in Spain, but you can't have a team like that in Brazil. So they have nothing to do. So they played that first Carioca match. So that was that team that played uh, this past Sunday that lost. Um, a lot of players that are like homegrown players. Um some players that used to be in the A team now in the B team. Um, and I don't know. I, it was a terrible match to, to start off. It was horrible. It was boring to watch. There was no consistency. There was no planning. There's everybody just seemed like they didn't, they didn't know what they were doing. Nobody knew what their, the role was in the pitch and everybody just kind of seemed lost. Um it's a different coach too. It's not Luis Castro as Lucio Flavio, which he used to be a player for Botafogo in the late two thousands. Um, great free kick taker. He's, he was amazing with the ball. Uh, not towards the end of the career. He was, he was kind of sour end of career at Botafogo, but he, he came back as a assistant coach and now the head coach, I guess you could say of the B team. Um, but I, I just don't think he's the man for that. And and I think it showed in the match, you know, we the the state tournaments now are super important because CBF changed the criteria um, for teams to make it into the Brazilian Cup, and now the 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 state tournaments have a, a bigger role in it. So you cannot overlook the state tournaments anymore, which is what John Texer was looking to do because what the fuck was supposed to be in Florida. Um, today's the 18th. They should have been here, or they would have been here for in four days, uh, and they would have stayed here until the end of the Carioca tournament, which is the start of the South American uh, Europa League, I guess. Anyway, um, but now they stayed in Brazil, and they're just doing their preseason there while the B team plays. But because the B team did so terrible. They're you're thinking about doing a mixed team. Maybe the reserves from the A team and the starters of the B team will go play the karaoke while well, the starters have a longer preparation. It's what the the room the rumor is. 
Yeah, and and we've we've been mentioning obviously on the podcast and, and especially this episode, John Textor, um, the uh, the owner of Botafogo, amongst other clubs, including Crystal Palace um, in, in the UK. Um, curious, um, you know, now everything looks to be doing really well in the club, uh, but Brazil traditionally, um, there's been a lot of um, you know, anxiety about accepting this, this, uh, SAF, uh, type ownership. Um, a lot of traditional yeah. clubs have not been, um, you know, very open to that idea, or at least their membership has not been, uh, what was the process and what was the reaction amongst fans when, when tech store, um, ended up getting the club and they, and they converted to that SAF model? Well, as, as supporters, we were relieved because mm -hmm. the club didn't have enough cash flow to make it another year. It was going to be one of those where we would have to pull a Juventus and go all the way down to the fourth division and work our way up sort of thing, you know? So very grateful that Texer came in and bought the club, that he understood what the club is, which I think is a very important thing. Um but we saw it as like a, a saving light, you know, it was hope again, but not everybody. Of course, there's, you know, people that don't agree with, with what's going on and they kind of have the, you know, we should take the club back mentality. Um, but I, that's not, that doesn't seem to be the model, man, um, to find long-term sustainability. Um, this SAF model uh, or at least just a, a model in general where the, the clubs start to become like an enterprise or, or a firm, I guess you can say, um, its own thing, its own entity, rather than an entity um, that the public, you know, a group of people took care of. Um, because not everybody was qualified to do it, which is why the club ended up in the position that it was a year ago, you know, two years ago. Um, so to actually see the club move forward in that department and not have to struggle with um, um, players' salary and or have enough money to pay the electricity, the water, like stuff like that. Like the club didn't even have money for that. So um, for those that are having a harder time understanding, I get it, but it was absolutely necessary. Okay, so you did mention earlier uh, how you would like Botafogo to win a title this year. And yeah. I want to go back and mention Copa do Brasil final 1999 against Juventude that won 2-1 on aggregate. And knowing how much the club would like to win this competition, do you think like the team has what it takes to thrive for success and achieve that goal? Uh, Copa do Brasil, yes, because it's a much different competition than the Brazilian Serie A, right? Because Brazilian Serie A is like the, uh, you know, like, like a Premier League, you know, it goes by points in the table, the best team wins over. Um, the Copa do Brasil is much like the FA Cup, right? Huge teams, little teams, any team in the country that qualifies can play that, you know? So the chances are a lot higher because... Um, you can probably play three teams from the city D or C or a B before you even get to play a city A team. So your chances of moving up that, that ladder are a lot higher and you move up a lot faster. And then when it comes to playing another city A teams, well, we're doing that in the other tournament already. So, um, if we know how to stop them from one for a game, which is all you need in the knockouts is to be able to win one game. So it makes things a lot easier and and that title a lot more reachable than the city. I don't think we're going to, you know, try to compete for that uh, point system title, not at least for another three or four years. I don't think it's going to happen, just to be completely honest, because you're going to need a squad in the likes of Palmeiras and Flamengo. And like I said, everybody in that team, starters reserves and substitutes they can play they can start on any other team in the country right so there you have to have a ridiculous squad to be able to play three or four competitions at once maintaining a certain level 
of quality. So Motherfogel's not there yet. When we lose a starter, we feel it. You know, when it's when it's starter, when it when it's our starting eleven playing against the other team's starting eleven, I'm not worried. I'm worried whenever my right back is injured, or my left back is injured, or you know my right winger is gone because we don't have other people for those positions. Those are positions that Botafogo are out in the market right now. And if we don't get those, we're going to have um, some tough games against teams that we should win. But we didn't because we just didn't have the quality in the in the reserves to to build that. So, yeah, man, uh, Copa do Brasil uh, is definitely within a grasp, I think. It's, especially, it's it's been a sour taste in our mouth, man, since 1999 because... On that first game that was 1-1, Botafogo actually won 3-1, but the refs, um, um, they called two goals offsides when they, they weren't offsides. And, you know, no VAR back then. So we got screwed out of that one. So we are we're looking forward to, to winning a Copa do Brasil title. It's like the one title we don't have. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and you you kind of mentioned this earlier uh, about Sudamericana um being a co- uh, you know a, a competition that's very uh within the your reach as well. Um are you worried at yeah. all like you said um you know Botafogo's squad maybe not as deep as uh clubs um like Flamengo or Palmeiras even Galo um you know are you worried at all that you may be too uh, you know, thinly spread across all these competitions. So many teams qualify for Sudamericana, Copa do Brasil, um, and then yeah. in addition to playing, um, you know, the regular Brasileirao games, um, you know, on top of, of course, the 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 Carioca State Tournament. Um, so, yeah. um, any worries there? Uh, it sounds like that may be a worry of yours. Um, I think the the clubs number one goal is to win the Sul Americana. And I think the other comp- competitions not called Brazilian Serie A are going to probably suffer from it. You know, uh, because the goal is you have to stay up in the Brazilian Serie A. You can't get relegated because that throws the whole thing out the window. So you have to do well there. And then you're back in the Sul Americana, which is a, a tournament that it's within our grasp. So, um, yeah, man, I, I it's kind of uh, something's gonna have to, give, you know, um, and I I prefer it be the the Carioca and the um, Copa do Brasil um, much more out places with Americana and the Serie A way way above those those competitions. Yep, and you did also go through earlier how Botafogo has had ups and downs and you not really being motivated to watch the team play. So with the club having won Serie B twice in its history, 2015 and 2021, what does that say about the team's performance during the last te- decade? Yeah, man. Uh, you know, it, it's been so rough these last few years. Um if things hadn't started to derail back in the early 2000s with like, again, not even early 2000s, since the 80s, people just doing bad management of the club, bad money, you know, spending more money than they have, we would have had a, a much more successful season. Uh, seasons, you know, there were, there were titles, even with all of this chaos happening with the club, there were competitions like in 2007, 2011, that it was like within our grasp, we had the title in our hands, sort of thing. Like we can do this, but again, we we just didn't have the the quality to to maintain. Uh, you know, we were spreading ourselves thin through all all these competitions. So, but seeing seeing that the club is doing better in that department makes me more relieved of seeing you know the 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 performances that you mentioned. You know, the, the from the past. You know, being relegated. Because winning the Serie B is a title, but it's not a nice title, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, it's like, yay, good job. You know, it's, it doesn't really mean anything. Because to, to us supporters, like, we should never be in that position in the place. You know, so 
Oh, hi. Um, sorry, she just jumped up here. Um, uh, I, I don't want to win another Serie B title ever again. Yeah, I mean, I think pretty much everyone feels the same way. Um, you know, you, you'll ju you're just happy to be back up uh, in, in Serie A. Um, so we kind of yeah, mentioned but now, but now, that now that we're back, we got to get to work. You know what I mean? <laughs> of course, we spent we, we spent spent too many years in the mud. So, you know, a lot of people are when it first happened. A lot of a lot of you know journalists and and people that work in TV were like, oh, you know, uh, another giant has been woken up. Like basically, Botafogo is back in the game. You know, been asleep for too long, but I think uh, I think we're finally there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you've seen that. I think there was some, some uh, even not counting last year, there were some pretty pretty uh, impressive bounce back years. I think once the first year back, you finished fourth or something like that. Um, yeah. But uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the new arrivals. Um, I watched your uh, 2023 uh, preview video up on your YouTube. We'll obviously put links to everything. Um, Really nice, really informative. We talked. Uh, you talked about uh, defensive midfielder Marlon, Marlon Freitas, uh, Luis Segovia, mm -hmm. um, coming off that uh, Sudamericana win last season with uh, mm -hmm. Independiente de Valle. Uh, mm -hmm. The young striker Carlos Alberto, and then spent a lot of time talking about Gio Gonzalez. Um, at that time, I think he was rumored. I'm not sure if he's much closer now, um, or or what the deal is on that. So. Of those players, who are you most excited uh, or curious to see in action this year? Um, I I I know Marlon Freitas is going to do great. He's a he's a great guy that I think he's he's found his form, and I think he's in his prime right now. So he's going to do whatever he can to continue that. And he you know during the off season, he was still running and working out and doing ball work, and he never you know he was taking breaks but he was still working uh you know keeping the skills sharp so um i think he's gonna come in come in and probably steal a starting spot uh in the team uh segovia is gonna be the automatic uh substitute for either cuesta which is the left-sided can you stop the left-sided left back and uh masao which is a left back um so Segovia is going to play in one of those two positions. Whoever's out out of, out of there, he's going to fill in that gap. Um, Carlos Alberto, he's going to be a um, um, he's a big question mark, right? A lot of people from the um, um, Atlético Mineiro camp were saying that he was uh, a rising star. He was really good. He's probably their biggest name since uh, Richarlison, and. But he just wasn't, you know, um, he just didn't adapt to the coach's, I guess, play style, kind of like Arison and Luis Castro. So he needed to, to go somewhere else to get some playing experience. Uh, unless he just does amazing in training um, or anything like that, I don't think he's going to start. Um, and then Gio Gonzalez that video that i made it was just like some rumors uh but there's there's been talks and negotiations between the club and the player is actually all ready to go um they're just waiting on Mallorca to figure out what they're going to do with them because um mafeo which is their starting right back he's been injured and slowly coming back so when mafeo is not playing uh geo is so what's going to happen there but when Mafei was healthy, Gio doesn't doesn't see a minute of play. So does he want to stay there for the rest of the season to see if he's going to be able to take that spot? Because Mafei was right back. He he came back, you know, from injury, and he's already playing right away. So that tells me that you know he's still in shape to be a starter. And so I don't think Gio is going to see a lot of a lot of minutes there. So he definitely do be a lot better. About the focus because he would be a starter, even though we have Rafael as a right back. Um, I think Gio is a lot more ready than Rafael because Rafael is coming from that Achilles tear, and that's a that's a tough injury to come back from. Then, yeah, that's yeah, really hopefully nasty. the 
hopefully the team makes the necessary changes that they need to uh, for this season because it's going to be a big one. Um, they need to perform well if they need if they want to survive in Campeonato Brasileiro. And every team needs great and united players in order to win. But sometimes the diversity also plays a big role in the team spirit. So when you look into big European clubs and even in Brazil, the teams who have this characteristics tend to win more titles in their respective clubs. And I know that Botafogo currently has a combination of players from Trinidad and Tobago, Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, and Paraguayan keeper who had an amazing tournament in the 2019 Copa America. And even the two Americans, Esteban Espinoza and Jacob Christian, who had experiences in Belgium. So in a way, do you think Botafogo has enough of this diversity, if you can say, to win the trophies in this, in the future? I mean, I, I think it's always great um, to have different players. Um, I'm not a proponent of like, you know, the team should be all Brazilians. No, the team should be whoever's the best players for the position, you know. It shouldn't the the nationality shouldn't matter, you know. It's what they're saying with their feet that should should matter. So, um, so yeah, I'm 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 a big supporter and big believer of having different kinds of play styles and experiences, and I think sometimes you can only get that by bringing in players from another country. Um, Brazil, I think, has a, a um, max of four you can have. Um, I don't I don't quite remember right now. It's like a, a small number. It's a low number. Um, and I think it should probably go up to like five, to be honest. I think five, six would be good um, because we would have a lot more people from other nationalities. And I think that only enhances um, the tournament because maybe a player won't come just because the team's already at a limit, you know, where – He's clearly good enough to play in Brazil, but, you know, the goalkeeper, like Botafogo, for example, you know, our keepers from Paraguay. And then we have Segovia, which is from Ecuador. And then Cuesta, which is Argentinian. Oh, Cuesta is now Brazilian as well. Um, or just say Jacob Montes, I don't know, um, playing in the middle. That's already three foreigners. Let's just say they're all starters and we're not taking them out. It doesn't matter who it's coming. Well, if there's this big promise that was playing somewhere else and wanted to come and be a starter, but he can only come if he's starting because he's a starter here, so he's got to start here too. And he's like, I can't because I already have three. Like These are players that are, you know, like a foundation to the team. And I think you're only hurting the the competition if you put limits on, on players like that because sometimes the talent is going to be somewhere else, you know? Um, so I think the more diversity you have, uh, I think the better. And I think Botafogo is going to do that, uh, especially now with John Texter being able to have Florida FC, which has a bunch of people from different nationalities and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm excited. I think uh, Botafogo is going to produce some international players that were actually homegrown, you know, kind of like Messi at Barcelona and Nice. Very interesting. Um, wanted to just switch gears um, to a, a Brazilian player who um, was uh, um, most expensive signing in history for Botafogo, uh, Patrick de Paula. Um, missed chunks of last season. Um, Castro said he wasn't in a condition to play. Um, such a highly touted young young player in that midfield. Um what what are you looking for him from him uh, in in this new and upcoming season? Do you think he's going to get back to his ways when he was at Palmeiras, um, or are you so. is is the fan base kind of more down on him? Yeah. No, the fan base is actually really believing him. I think out of all of the players from you know twenty seven on the eighteen, I think he works the hardest during the off season. He hired a personal trainer. He was working out every day, doing uh, agility drills and specific movement drills. And, and he looks thin. He looks in shape. You know, um, he was kind of out of shape last season. He was kind of not taking things seriously um, from what I've heard um, backstage. But it seems like he really 
had a real big shift in mentality. Um, like people are even saying, like he's starting to look more like the Patrick Chipala from Palmeiras than than the one that he he was last season, and that's very exciting because you're gonna have players like Marlon Freitas, Patrick Chipala. Um, Carlos Eduardo, which is a great player, man. He's such a complete midfielder, so crazy. Lucas Fernandes as well. Uh, at the end of, uh, I think it's going to be a sour memory for Santos su supporters, but that was a uh, uh, man like that. Lucas Fernandes right there, he starts in any any team in Brazil. You know, if it wasn't close to the World Cup, it was like at the beginning of a World Cup journey. I think. Um, the the coach would have had his eye on him. He's he's a Premier League player. I don't think he lasts another two seasons about the Fogo group, to be honest with you. Yeah, Lucas, but, like you mentioned. But that's great for the team. That's great for the team. They have so many – this is what I was saying earlier. I'm not worried about the midfield because we've got so many that are good. You know, if Patrick Gipala comes back, that's just an extra one. You know, that's the one um, – I think we're missing like a very creative – you know, sort of like a cam, the number 10. Um, Castro has already said that he doesn't like playing with a number 10, so that's not the type of players that we're going for. He likes to have two box-to-box -box up and down. He likes to have winger, winger, striker, two box-to-box, -box and a holding mid. That's how Castro plays. Um, <clears throat> so the box-to-box -box players, when they're complete, they're usually – are good at everything, but not excellent, uh, like dribbling or something really fancy, you know, which I think as supporters, you're missing that. Like you want to see the flair, just like, you know, Robinho and Diego and Neymar, you know, coming up at Santos, you always had that one player that was so talented. Um, Botafogo may not find one like that playing in, that, in those positions, but Gaster really believes that the wingers should be the most talented uh, as well as the holding mids. That's why we have so many good holding mids in, in Botafogo. Um, Castro believes it's the team, the mid is the is the foundation of the team. That's his belief. So, um, so yeah, man, I, I, it's it's great. I just, I, I'm, I'm excited, but um, I really believe Patrick Gipal is going to um, turn it around this year. Nice. That, that's great to hear. And yeah, like you said, Lucas, absolutely. What a masterclass against Santos last year. Obviously, we're a little bit sour grapes about it, but uh, it, you know, it was it was great to see. And honestly, we were the we didn't deserve anything out of that game, anyways. Um, really quick, we're gonna get some predictions out of you, but just before we get to predictions, one more player I want to ask you. We're talking about the win the wingers. Obviously, Jeffinho had a great end to the season. Very talented. Can you tell us a little bit about Luis Enrique? Um, highly touted prospect coming out of Brazil, went to Marseille, um, kind of lost track with him, um, but now he's back on loan. Um, have you seen much from him, and um, are you excited about uh, his prospects? Um, yeah, he, he's actually a, a Botafogo Academy player. Um they got sold to Marseille and then loaned back to Botafogo after the, the couple of seasons that he had there weren't that good. Um, I believe he had said in an interview that it was a clash of um, like what the coach wanted versus what he could offer. Kind of like, again, Edison and Luis Castro. They just didn't see a lot of play. And he came back to Brazil. We were kind of wondering, you know, because he obviously went and – you know, he's playing in Europe and he's playing with a, a, a talent level that's probably higher than what Botafogo had at the time. Um, so we were all wondering, did he improve at all? You know, is he or is he the same player? And when he came back, he actually it was a shadow of a, the player that he was when he was at Botafogo. So no wonder he wasn't getting any play time at Marseille. Um, I think he lost some of the swiftness that he had because he, he's a lot bigger now, but he's a lot more muscular. Um, he was smaller. Um, and a lot of a lot of supporters kind of pointed that out a little bit too, even though <clears throat> I think Indiana doesn't really matter too much. Um, 
like we just haven't seen it um i haven't heard from uh my uh Botafogo journalist friends how he's doing it in training uh i haven't got a word of that just yet um but yeah i mean he, he's supposed to be jeffinho's immediate substitute so you know um and the, and the left the left wing is something that inside Botafogo is not seen as a prior, priority right now. All right. So uh, just to finish the podcast, some quick predictions with you. We're going to start with the uh, upcoming game next week, which is going to be Botafogo against Vasco. A great rivalry, as we mentioned earlier. I yeah. want you to predict predictions for this match and also from competitions like Copinha, Campeonato Carioca, Brasileiro, Copa do Brasil, and Copa Sudamericana. Um, the game against Vasco is going to depend which Botafogo shows up to play. If it's the A team or the B team. If it's the B team, I believe we lose. Um, if it's the A team, I believe we win. Um, a tie. I mean, a tie could happen. I don't. I don't see us losing against Vasco just yet. Um, they're they're at the stage that Botafogo was when Botafogo first became the the SAF uh, model. So the players are all still kind of new to each other. They they have this chemistry issue that I think is going to play a factor. And and I think, in my honest opinion, I think they have a coach that is not qualified for the project. I don't think he's qualified enough for the project. So I if I think if Botafogo shows up with the A team, I think it's a victory. Um, and I'll say like 2-0, 3-0. Um, the Copinha, which is the the under-19, I believe, tournament. Botafogo just uh, got knocked out of that. Um, really, really an unfortunate loss, actually. Um, yeah, anyways. So, so yeah, they're, they're out of that. Um, the Carioca. To be honest, and a lot of the other supporters, we don't care as long as we meet the quota for the uh, Copa do Brazil. You know, so whatever the minimum is, uh, as long as we get there, we're good. Now, obviously, winning titles is always great, especially against other four Rio uh, rivals. So if a final is Botafogo, Vasco, Botafogo, Fluminense, Botafogo, and Flamengo, those are going to be big matches. You know, so even if it's just a state tournament, it's still a big match. Um, I particularly don't care about winning that. I want to win everything, but if I had to choose one not to win, that'd be the one. Um, uh, Copa do Brasil, I think we have a chance. Um, I'd be very surprised if we get knocked out before the quarterfinals. I think quarterfinals is probably uh, um, a good guess, good prediction, and then with with some. Some well executed game plays and a little bit of luck. I think we can probably go all the way. Um, because it is a knockout tournament. Now uh, the Brazilian said, yeah, I don't see us in a top three. Um, I think anywhere between fifth and eighth is probably where we, we will uh will end up. Um Sul Americana, um the thing is a lot of fans um about the footwear like Sul Americana is a must. Like it's a there's no excuse to win the Sul Americana. But that is also what the other teams are saying. So you know it's not that Botafogo you know have the luxury of letting this one go. Like every team wants to win. And the teams that are coming down from the Libertadores are gonna be tough. So but I also believe because it is sort of a knock it's a knockout competition. Um, to win it, and I think Botafogo does really good in, in games like that. Uh, it's a title that we can also uh, get this year, uh, and I believe it's the title that's going to be focused on. It's a limited kind of title, so yeah, for sure. Did I, did I miss anything? Any other other competition? Uh, I think I forgot to ask you about Copa Libertadores. I know Botafogo isn't playing, but who would you say would win that competition? You always got to put teams like Palmeiras and uh, Flamengo out there. Um, okay. Atlético Mineiro and Galo, you can probably put them up there too. It just depends which which uh, Mineiro is going to show up. 
the last year they they had a really rocky season um compared to the one before right because they won everything in their season before that mm-hmm. um and you can never count, you know, the big teams, River Plate, Booker Juniors, uh, the Piente del Valle, because uh, they they won last year, so they're playing the Libertadores this year. You can never you can never discount those um, those teams. It's a knockout, like I said. You need a, you need a well executed plan and a little bit of luck. So if you have the game of your life every match until the final, then you know you can win, even if it's a a, a big underdog, but it's going to be very hard <laughs> to beat Palmeiras and Flamengo and Boca Juniors and River play it. It's going to be, it's going to be tough. But one of those four, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's what hopefully it looks not like. Flamengo. <laughs> yeah. I think for the, I think for everyone's sanity, I don't think we need another Palmeiras Flamengo final. Um, <laughs> no. And, man. and from your side, definitely not Flamengo. And from our side, definitely not Palmeiras. So, um, Pete, thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, I think this has been, uh, you know, enlightening, um, and really, really entertaining. Um, where can people find your stuff? Uh, if they, if they want to learn more about you, uh, your career in media, or uh, of course about Botafogo. Uh, first of all, thank you guys for uh, inviting me. It was real fun to talk to you guys. Um, definitely do it again sometimes if you want. Um, even bring you guys up to my channel if you guys want to come and, and talk over there. That'd be great. Um, you guys can find me if you're interested in like entertainment sort of stuff, media, TV shows. Like I interview actors and and, and go to Comic Cons and stuff like that. So if you like stuff like that, um, my channel is at Pete the Heat. So it's P E T E the letter D and then the the word Heat. Um, you can find me there on YouTube. Find me on Twitter. Uh, and I think just about everything. When you're a content creator, you want to be as you want to be everywhere. So, at Pete the Heat, at one one of these platforms, and you will find me. And then, if you want to find, you know, if you want to follow Botafogo, if you want to follow what's going on with the club, um, in English, um, and I have to press the translate button on Twitter, you can uh, find me there. <laughs> on YouTube at Glorious Botafogo. Um, if you just type that on the search bar, the channel will come up. Uh, on Twitter as well, uh, and Instagram. Uh, even though I don't really post that much on Instagram, I, I'm I'm a Twitter, Twitter uh, fanboy forever. Yeah, sa- same here, same here. And uh, yeah, you're closing in on two two K on on YouTube, which is awesome to see. It's great to see yeah. that sort of traction for for Brazilian content in English. So yeah, awesome, awesome to see. And and uh, once again, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks guys, I appreciate it. All right. Sounds good. Everyone have a great night.